I like you guys hear me. That is so good. Should yeah. be on you. Yeah. That was good. Okay. How many I answers learned from both. Uh oh. Mistakes. Mistakes. Somebody played three. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> A huge diagnostic study here. <laughs> I'm covered. Um, so, hi guys, uh, Sivan, if you enjoy it, we will kind of just wrap up the discussion. Um, we'll kind of go through kind of categories in which we already did this with got sessions of this course. Um, but I thought it was a pretty interesting paper. It makes a kind of question for some of us. So, this is like a nice little study. Uh, that is in like the one of those papers that progress. But um, it's important to know that the different stages of the study are prone to specific types of biases themselves. And so the big takeaway, right, is to be mindful of how various diagnostic values that we cite apply in practice. So like the ratios, the sensitivities and specificities, um, how they're affected pretty dramatically by the presence of any of these biases. Um, I thought the inclusion criteria was fairly comprehensive, right? They're consecutively taking um, and for the most part, you know, the presentation spans the whole spectrum. The exclusion criteria, you can peruse them in the paper itself. Um, I kind of listed some of the ones that I thought were more salient. Um, and I think we'll probably talk about this in the breakout sessions, but it's really important to consider, you know, the availability of the standard study for all patients is really important, right, in all diagnostic studies. Um, and then to think about sort of the types of patients that are excluded for whatever reason. So if my activities, for example, right, you know, probably wouldn't expect someone who's maybe done like five scans or six scans um, to then be able to differentiate between a funeral, chronic, chronic, all those things, uh, people who follow up, et cetera. Um, so it's important to take those into consideration. Um, and then this paper is unique in the fact that, like, you have a pretty low threshold for providers to be participants in scanning, um, which is good because it kind of represents the everyman uh, scenario, essentially. Um, and it's a wide range of mid levels to pending. Um, most ultrasound studies end up having about 40 to 50 scans before you be able to enroll patients. And so this kind of breaks from that, essentially. Um, it's interesting here that the imposition or the middle level basically, or the middle level with the attending supervision is basically seeing the patient, assigning a pre test probability, uh, performing the scan, and then interpreting their own diagnostic study. So this is kind of problematic, uh, major. Um, and then, you know, the study that you're seeing here, if you're doing a, a bedside sano, which is above the thigh, the radiology tech who's certified is doing the whole like DT study, whether that has any sort of Clinical impact later, you know. I mean, there are some patients who have these like isolated popliteal DVTs, which you don't necessarily treat all the time, right? But some of those patients later end up having more proximal DVTs on like the repeat ultrasound that's done later, and so then it means false negatives possibly for uh, us. Um, and the outcomes are kind of surprising, at least for you know. I mean, just because I think we're kind of taught that, you know, if you see something, right, it, it's like the, well, like, so with Montag, you see something, you say something. So if you see something on Asana, right, you are maybe diagnosing something, possibly. Um, but you see that sensitivities and specificities are not that impressive. Um, you know, you have a pretty good positive likelihood ratio in this paper at 6.5, negative about 0.3, but uh, pretty indeterminate for the most part results. Uh, they mentioned that, you know, if you pair with like a pretest probability, right, um, you can increase sort of the accuracy of the test, but that's really in this like one specific core of patients who you had a very low pretest probability for UET, you had a negative beta ultrasound, and then the formal radiology was also. So that was about in 88 patients out of 33. And then there's a conversation about provider experience, and so the more scans you do, the better your accuracy is, but you know, it's not like you've had this like assessment of iterator without reliability to see how different providers could correct um, the scan themselves. Um, so kind of moving on to like the specific biases. So at least with this paper, right, one of the big parts is that every patient essentially received both the index test, the bedside sonal, and the formal ultrasound. 
from bias. Can you go back one slide? Yeah. So what partial verification means is uh, it's not a you have to verify that whether the patients have disease or not that they understand, right? Yeah. If partial verification, <clears throat> if you are really suspecting someone having PE, push for them to get the CTA. And if your uh, suspicion is low, push them not to get CTA and then put them in the gold standard follow up, right? So, so if, if, if patients with high previous probability get the, get the aggressive, uh, gold standard and the patient lower risk, they get other gold standards. Um, that that's where the verification bias kicks in. But if you do the gold standard for everyone, and that was the ideal situation, uh, and like this DBT is this, this paper, then verification bias doesn't exist because everyone got the, the standard. And and in this paper, they had actually two elements of the standard that everybody got. So this is less. Um, that less an issue. So I just wanted to give you an example of what a uh, partial verification. Yeah, we sometimes call like a workup bias, quote unquote. And right. so another example is, for example, say you have patients coming in in terms of stroke. If your index test is a facial group, and those patients, the ones that get MRIs, obviously there's you know, there are patients who don't have facial groups who have strokes, but if they're not getting the MRIs to diagnose the test, right, there's going to be some level of bias here for the workup. Just second for us to say kind of patients essentially. Um, talking more about spectrum bias. And so, you know, this is kind of getting into the fact that you know, you're talking about who was enrolled in your study, whether your inclusion criteria is broadly inclusive or not, is your cohort diverse and representative the spectrum of disease. Um, and I would say, at least for you know, applying all this paper, um, they're able to essentially consecutively sample all comers for the most part with concern for clot. Um, you know, it's a fairly diverse cohort of patients and presentations, um, you know, kind of going back to the criteria. There. Um, but uh, one thing we note is that most patients are having a constipation. <coughs> so if, you, if you're going to do an ultrasound, you're probably concerned about the patient having um, some sort of DBT. Um, so that does introduce some level of spectrum bias here. Um, and then lastly, in terms of what we're doing with these more difficult cases, um, I think this is a kind of unavoidable problem with a lot of studies because you're gonna have patients who can't follow up, right? So you can't really contact them in 30 days to see if they've developed any symptoms. Uh, people who have chronic DBTs, for example, right? It's hard to really get assessment for who aren't like, you know, high level sonographers to make that assessment. And so you're gonna be eliminating these patients from a like, population of large, and so that's gonna see impacts and results. Uh, so this uh, paper does have some level of spectrum bias, but I think they do a, a decent job for those part. Sorry, one point. Yeah. Uh, so my, my opinion on the patient selection is they didn't mention that they enrolled patients consecutively. Right? Did you did you hear did you read that anywhere that says patients were enrolled consecutively? Did they mention that this was a cross-sectional study apparently enrolls everyone? No. And, and they, they used the term um, was it self so, so, for, 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 for. so the, is it possible that patients who 
Okay, can everyone hear us? We're good now? Thumbs up. Great, thanks. That's a good sign. Um, moving on to your interpretation bias with this study. Um, as they discussed in the paper, they decided to make the ambiguous results positive. Um, and they're pretty clear about this. Disclosing this data not remove conditions from the analysis itself. And so if you actually do the calculation and make the determined results negative, you end up having like use sensitivity is actually dropped about almost like 60 from 70. So it's important. So by doing this, right, it kind of artificially increases the sensitivity of uh, that's that ultrasound. But I think it's somewhat relevant though, because if you think about it kind of what you do in reality, but say you're a patient who has a you have some, some suspicion for PE, you get a scan and it's indeterminate for whatever reason, it's poor contrast, poor study. You end up probably admitting that patient if you're concerned enough to start anti coagulation because you're assuming that this possible positive to get out of a recent test or like a EU scan. So I feel like, at least in the clinical sense, it is the way that I was kind of understand it. It makes sense to sort of treat this as positive as long as you disclose kind of that as a like, um, going on to review bias, um, this is essentially about blinding. And so, at least with this paper, right, um, the imposition of blinding to the results of the radiology read. And so, you're less likely to artificially falsely interpret like your positive like blinding. So, at least this was. So, the radiologist blind the results of the EM stuff? Uh, so, yeah, so going on to disease verification bias, right, the incorporation. So, um, at least for this paper, um, the radiologists were not really aware of like, that side of sound findings. And so, at least with that, they weren't incorporated in the, the initial ideas. Um, obviously, you know, <clears throat> in real life, right, like you'll get that call from radiology about whatever CAT scanning order, whatever DP study order, what are you concerned about, et cetera. Um, so, there is some priming, so at least here you have like this separation of that. Um, and then to kind of talk about differential verification um, and double gold standard. Um, I guess with this, I mean, often with like the PE papers, you have like the dimer and follow up versus the CTA. Here, everyone basically got like the formal DPT ultrasound, whether you have a positive uh, bedside sauna or a negative bedside sauna. So I think. A little bit less of like a thing to do about this paper. Um, but I think what I got from like different PE studies is that with like your follow up alone group, right? The ones who have the dimer done and then follow up to sort of see if they developed like the PE or not, symptoms, you end up, I think, increasing sort of the sensitivity just because you're not really catching these, you know, like false, you know, these like sub segmental PEs or maybe not significant PEs since you're not scanning it. Long, so that's it. As well. So, kind of in summary, um, you know, there is spectrum bias that's present with this paper. Um, your, your intermediate sound was arbitrarily raised the sensitivity of the bedside uh, findings. And, you know, there's a pretty huge operator dependency, right? Um, back on accuracy. There's no real comment on your reliability. So, it's not like you have the same patient that we scan by <clears throat> different PGY levels or different. That's confirmed later. Um, and then I think the whole idea of having one person basically decide on the pretest probability, do the scan, interpret the scan, um, I think that's kind of like sketchy in a way just because it's, you know, you're going to take your own kind of bias to like the scan itself. Um, but I think overall, it's a pretty rigorous trial, it's pretty good methodology. Um, definitely reduced to the fact that like, they have their default lined up. Um, and overall, it's pretty realistic because you have a wide range of sonographers and skill sets. 